So when we think about artificial intelligence, we sit at this crossroad where we often hear like a quote like this, a very apocalyptic picture painted for us about what the future is going to be like. I'm here to fly in the face of that. You might refer to this Stephen Hawking quote or similar quotes made from Elon Musk or even from Bill Gates. I have a much more optimistic outlook that I want to talk about with you here today. So when we think about AI, the term was first coined in 1956. That's 61 years ago. And since then, we've done very little to educate the general public on the nuances of artificial intelligence and what that actually means. What is its impact on our lives? So the first thing that I want to draw a distinction around is the difference between artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence, a new acronym, AGI. So if you remember one thing, AGI, come away with that tonight and tell your friends. Because artificial general intelligence is what people typically think of when they imagine that robot buddy they're going to have in the future that has full autonomy, total consciousness. It might be as intelligent as them. It might be even a little bit more intelligent than them. We are so far away from that today. And it's something that we may not even see in our lifetime. I think we're focusing our attention on the wrong thing. I want to argue that we should be scrutinizing people. It's the people who are doing the programming of AI today that really have an impact on driving the future of where this technology goes. And people are wonderful, but we all have so much baggage, don't we? We have biases, and we have prejudices, and we have all sorts of different ethical values, beliefs, and religions that inform in what we do every day. And we bring that with us, quite frankly, to our work. But we luckily have new rules for the cognitive era. So we have at IBM established the role of an ethics advisor. We have field testing in our production process before anything gets deployed. And then explanation-based collateral systems. So if you're working with Watson and you ask Watson a question, you will not only get a very quick answer, you'll find out the level of confidence Watson has in that answer. You'll find out all of the rationale behind the decision-making process. So that's really great, right? But what about bias? What happens when we talk about bias? Who here in this room would purport to be biased? Raise your hand. That's great, it's everyone. And it's inevitable that humans are all biased. It's part of what makes us human, quite frankly. And these gut instincts and our feelings that we sometimes get in the pit of our stomach that give us a sense, you know, I should do this thing instead of that, all of these underlying fundamental drivers, which sometimes include religion, help us to inform the up to 35,000 decisions we make on average, each and every day. So what about turning our attention now to religion? Who here in the room believes in God? So whether you do or not, you've certainly heard of this quote before. We all have. And I would argue that we stand here today at this point where we're creating artificial intelligence in our own image. And we need to be very, very careful about how we're doing that and how we're programming for that. So if we turn the table the other way and ask Watson, hey, Watson, do you believe in God? How would Watson respond? Well, that would actually depend on which instance of Watson you were talking to. Watson is trained in several different domains and has very deep domain knowledge in each of those areas. So, are we talking to financial services, Watson? Or are we talking to legal Watson? We might be lucky enough to talk to that Watson who won Jeopardy. But today, let's pretend that we're talking to the Watson that's very skilled in understanding medicine and oncology. And when we think about that, we're definitely treading in the territory of life and death. And with life and death, inevitably comes up the topic of religion. Just think back a few years to all of the controversy that was surrounding the Terry Schiavo case. And then pivot for a moment to other legal aspects, such as the fact that there are 13 countries in the world where being an atheist is illegal. Not only is it illegal, but it is punishable by death. And you see how important it is for us to consider what religion means when we train our cognitive systems. 
So we have these people that we call quality experts, and it's pretty easy for us now to take structured and unstructured data and feed it into Watson. But what we have to understand, and where the subjectivity comes in, is another acronym called URL. That's our ability to help Watson understand and reason and learn. And that's the area, again, where we need to focus our attention as to what we're programming into the systems, as well as algorithmic accountability. What's happening in our data sets? Where is the data coming from? Is it coming from a safe source? And are our data sets biased? Ultimately, when we look at the values that we're embedding into the system, we're going to ultimately need to agree on what those are and where they're coming from. Do, are they reflective of Judeo-Christian values? Are they reflective of secular values? Or are they reflective of values that we haven't even defined yet? That is what keeps me up at night. Despite that, I have a very, very positive feeling about the future. In just three years, we'll see five million people connected to the internet. That's more than half of the world's global population. So all different people from different races, religions, colors, creeds, working together online, be it with AI, be it with quantum computing on the cloud. It'll be a miraculous time for us to think together. So what I ask you here today, and the question on the table that I want to leave you with, is really this. The question is not whether machines think, but whether humans do. Thank you very much.